This is New York, a miracle city, a city of tall buildings, narrow dark streets, magnificent parks, broad avenues, homes and schools, stores and theaters, and palatial hotels. A fascinating city, an incredible city, the commercial and cultural heart of a great nation. Welcome to Operation Jane Walk, a city tour through the architecture of an online shooter game by Robin Klingel and Leonhard Mulner. I'm your guide through the city, Jacob Bannigan. Take a look around us. The weather's looking pretty good for our tour today. Light snowfall, good visibility. Everyone here is in their host body, which will carry them through New York. I'm the one wearing the red jacket, so just follow me. As we begin, a short introduction into controls to move the body, standard W, A, S, and D, and your mouse position changes the camera position. Just click around and get used to that. I want to make sure everyone's comfortable, we don't want to lose anyone on the tour. When we're ready, just follow me down the street here, up onto the bus stop. Take a look around us. Behind us we see the highway, the Franklin D. Roosevelt Drive. Behind that, the East River. Through the clouds, we might see some skyscrapers in the background. So, New York serves as the stage picture around us. It was recreated in great detail in digital space for the game, making a scenery which consists of facades, background characters, props, whole atmosphere. We're in a narrative skill game, the multiplayer shooter Tom Clancy's The Division but today we will walk through the battlefield with a peaceful intention and just focus on the city itself. The setting of the game, the story, is in post-apocalyptic New York. A situation of lawlessness, anarchy. These cars around us are dead. The city is standing quite still. A snowy dystopia. New York is under martial law, which can be dangerous for us casual urban explorers. We are just strolling about, but instead of parasols, we carry rifles. Instead of cameras, we look through our scopes. Our first stop on our tour, The Projects, a residential settlement built between 1943 and 1945. An important figure in 20th century urban planning, Le Corbusier, who was a revolutionary architect. His vision, old structures need to be replaced. His plan, greatly destroy New York and rebuild it, according to his great vision. Another important figure, Robert Moses, an urbanist from New York, changed the face of the city. He displaced 250,000 people in his plans. He demolished entire quarters here, the Gas House District. 11,000 people lost their homes to make way for this new social housing project. This was constructed mainly for war veterans. It was built to combat the housing shortage in the 40s, but also with the intention to renew the so-called spoiled urban fabric. Stuyvesant was originally planned solely for white veterans. So let's continue on to the next project involving Robert Moses, the Franklin D. Roosevelt Drive. Follow me. Oh, just ignore the bullets and keep going. We'll listen to Django Reinhardt's version of You're Driving Me Crazy. more about Robert Moses. No one else in the history of urbanism has built more miles of roads. Moses' vision was to frame Manhattan with big highways, which he succeeded in doing. In the post-war era, white middle class moved from downtown into the suburbs, feeding urban sprawl. Moses tried to solve congestion, more highways, which accommodate more cars, which ironically led to more traffic. 
New York became the city of cars. Moses had planned to install a 10-lane highway dividing the inner heart of Manhattan, but there was resistance. Civil movements succeeded in opposing his plans. Perhaps Moses' most important antagonist was Jane Jacobs. In her legendary book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, she radically questions the urbanist paradigms of her time. And with her, the era of unquestioned car-based city planning ended. But only in this dystopian version of New York are her dreams finally realized. New York has become a pedestrian city. Manhattan is no longer a hyper-motorized Venice, as it was often described. No rushing traffic streams between the urban archipelagos. The congestion, the city's essential condition, according to Rem Koolhaas, is gone. And maybe the biggest transformation of New York, from physical reality into this digital world, the city has become a backdrop landscape for armed flaneurs and urban explorers like us. Our cars only serve as protective shields from enemy bullets. Okay, as we enter this bleak playground setting, we see an extra character in the background. He's always here. Just wait for a second and watch him for a while. It's a bizarre performance. Now, if we don't disturb him, he will continue his performance forever. His rhythmic beats make the cadence of this brutalized world like a metronome. The hits echo between the houses. This is the rhythm of this dead city. Here we see brownstones, houses made of brown sandstone, typical 19th century architecture for the East Coast. The stairs in front of the brownstones are called stoops. Staircases that not only keep away the dirt from the house, but they also serve a social function. Sitting on the stairs, watching children, chit-chatting, meeting neighbors as they pass, the stoop became part of the fabric of the neighborhood. Without government intervention, crime is reduced. Streets become more beautiful and lively. According to Jane Jacobs, such neighborhoods work better than those with courtyards. And as we continue, we listen to The Brothers Comatose, a song from their album, Songs from the Stoop. At the beginning of the 20th century, the car park is a palace. The car is not just parked, but presented to the public. This science of strolling, promenadology, reclaims the park house on foot. And why is this? Because of the fantastic view one can have from the top of the building. This is just what we're going to treat ourselves to here. Now we have a sniper gun in our backpack, activated with the key 2. Aim with the right mouse click and press tab. Now we're in the scope, we can use it as binoculars to check out the surroundings. Okay, let's be careful. We have enemies in the area. And we don't want a firefight. Let's hope we can prevent conflict. We should hide, so come close to the truck. There we are. And, all right. We have to defend ourselves, sorry about that. Let's keep the tour going. So, before us, we see the headquarters of the United Nations, built in 1952. The vision of world peace finds its form, at least that's the idea. After the Second World War, a consensus among the nations that a powerful international organization is needed to prevent such catastrophes from happening in the future. 
In order to create a convincing monument for a new world order, an international board of architects is gathered together. Le Corbusier is sent from France, and his first sketches lead the way. A big monolith in the minimalistic style. A stark, naked, modernist shape that's not meant to resemble any previous era. The winning blueprint comes from Brazilian architect Oscar Niemeyer. Le Corbusier, not commissioned to create the final product, leaves frustrated. One point of criticism of the UN building is that the defining shape is the secretariat, the big monolith, and not the assembly hall, seeming to indicate that administration dominates rather than international understanding. However, it does mark a break in style. Post-war New York is built in this modernist style. Glass cubes dominate, not historicist buildings like the ones behind us. And no good tour of a city is complete without a look at the guts. Let's go down into the sewers. Follow us down here. The New York sewer system is one of the biggest on the planet, of course. The total weight of all the daily processed feces is bigger than the total weight of all the elephants on the earth. However, in this post-apocalyptic New York, no one's flushing any toilets. We can walk safely. And let's fill our auditory canals with Art Carney and his Song of the Sewer. I work in the sewer, it's a very hard job. You know they won't hire just any old slob. You don't have to wear a tie or a coat. You just have to know how to float. We sing the song of the sewer. Of the sewer, we sing this song. Together we stand. We're and let's just stop here to take a moment to appreciate this installation, modern sculpture, where the old ideas of individualized, motorized, gas-guzzling transport collides with the practical world of bicycles. The visions of traffic administrator Jeanette Seti Khan, who saw bicycle lanes, bus lanes, pedestrian areas as being healthy for the city, successful in places like Times Square, battling the old concepts of Moses, memorialized in this sculpture, quite brilliant by the game developers, whether they did it consciously or not. Okay, as we climb up here, we're going to admire the Pan Am building. Today is called the MetLife building, built in the 60s. It's a monument to the triumph of capitalism in the New World after World War II. Pan Am, of course, greatly profited from the Second World War, not just passenger aviation, but military aviation. All corporation headquarters we've seen on our tour profited greatly from World War II. The rise of the U.S. synchronized with the rise of capitalism and with the victory over the Axis powers. This mighty complex in front of us is the poster boy for this story. Partially responsible, of course, is Le Corbusier, but the architect that finished it, Walter Gropius. Let's leave this uh, uncomfortable situation, but stay flying in our ears with 1979 Pan Am song, We Fly the World, the airline's official advertising jingle. The last building here signifies a break in the narrative and in the history of New York. The 1960s saw economic growth, the 1970s oil crisis. Through globalization, production sites move out of the cities and we see the deindustrialization of Manhattan. For the first time in history, Manhattan faces an exodus and the city is close to bankruptcy. Banks take over governmental tasks. At the same time, the phenomenon of global cities emerges as described by Saskia Sassen. Decision processes and power concentrate in international hubs. Capital concentrates. Income disparities rise. The state has to cut money, and the ideology of neoliberalism gains popularity. At this time, Donald Trump becomes a character in the history of the city. He buys cheap buildings like the Bon Witt Teller store here and demolishes them. In their stead, he builds luxury apartments and hotels like the Trump Tower on this parcel. The desperate municipality grants him generous loans and tax abatements. One could call it a subsidized living space for the elite. Manhattan becomes an island of the rich. Also at this time, the taste of the elites change. Modernist architecture was not interpreted as progressive any longer, rather as cold and anonymous. Wealth was not hidden, but presented. Concrete disappears behind glass facades. Trump Tower is a good example. This building from 1983 has a relatively minimalist exterior, but inside a superabundance of gold and specially imported Italian marble. 
now as Trump has become president, this place has become a center of political power. Here, decisions about war and peace in the 21st century are perhaps being made. In this apocalyptic version of New York, the symbol of his reign is in debris and sinks into the post-apocalyptic snow. Our story ends here as well. Thank you for joining us. And thanks to all the people that built this scenery. They have memorialized important parts of the history of the 20th century here in digital space. Perfect material for an artistic appropriation. Today, the battle in the bloody snow is replaced by our attempt at a peaceful walk, passing by silent witnesses to history, architecture, and politics. 